Okay, it's, uh, I think, think our numbers have leveled for the moment. It's lovely. Welcome to everybody who's joining us uh, for our new shoots in ecumen ecumenism uh, this morning. I'm the Reverend Mary Kate Garden. I'm um, a priest in the Diocese of Ottawa and I'm uh, moderating this session. And I'd like to welcome everybody, uh, those of you who are joining us for the first time, um, and those of you who've been with us yesterday through uh, some really uh, dynamic sessions uh, to this conference sponsored by the Trinity Divinity um, Alumni Executive. Uh, this morning, we're going to begin, as you will recall, we've started with uh, looking at uh, an overview, if you will, of ecumenism. Um, we had a session on looking at the shoots entwining in Anglican and Roman Catholic. And then at the end of the day, before we uh, met for Evensong, we had uh, a session on looking at uh, new shoots on the National Church. And this morning, we are going to focus on some initiatives, look at some on the ground uh, activities and uh, ideas that are happening in local areas and in communities. Before I do that, I would like to acknowledge that Trinity College and the University um, are stand on occupied land, which is part of the traditional territories of the Wendat the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the Mississaugas of the New Credit, an Anishinaabe people. And it's land that is covered with the dish with one spoon, wampum belt, covenant. And we acknowledge that people are joining us from across Turtle Island. And we are grateful for the stewardship of this land by the First Nations and the continuing presence of indigenous, pe indigenous people from all of Turtle Island. And we commit ourselves to seeking a new and honorable relationship with the First Peoples of this land. As we as we gather this morning, for some of us, it's uh, some of our traditions. It's uh, Ascension Day is uh, celebrated today. So, in addition to uh, the prayer that I would like to offer to all of us, I'm going to begin with um, the Anglican or one colic from the Anglican tradition uh, to mark this day. So let us pray. Almighty God, your son Jesus Christ ascended to the throne of heaven that he might rule over all things as Lord. Keep the church in the unity of the spirit and in the bond of his peace and bring the whole of creation to worship at his feet, who is alive and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Lord God, we pray for your church that we may grow into either ever greater unity and love. Lord Jesus Christ, you taught your disciples to be one, even as you and your Father are one. You call us in our own day to work for that unity, which is your gift and your will. Send your spirit of concord into the hearts of all Christian people, that we may have the humility to learn the truth that others bring the wisdom to find words that give voice to a shared and greater vision of God, and the love that refuses to rest until all are reconciled as one family of faith in you. Amen. And uh, before, just before I turn it over to our speaker, we have four speakers. We have a really exciting lineup today. We've had exciting lineups for the past two days. Um, We'll hear first from uh, Sandra Bursel as our first speaker, who will give us a, a little bit of background in local initiatives and local enterprises. And Sandra is an ordained minister in the United Church of Canada. She's originally from Brampton, Ontario, and she served parishes, including an Anglican United uh, Shared Ministry in Newfoundland, and Labrador, and rural Ontario. She's recently retired from 24 years as a professor of church history and ecumenics at St. Andrew's College, Saskatoon, where she resides. Lee Kern, the Reverend Lee Kern, is the Right Relations Coordinator at the Anglican Diocese of Toronto, which is a sovereign territory of the Michi Sagig Nashnabig. 
Lee was ordained to the priesthood in 2016. She served at uh, St. James Cathedral in downtown Toronto uh, for three years. In 2019, Lee was appointed to the right relation as right relations coordinator for the Diocese of Toronto and cross appointed to the Toronto Urban Native Ministry. They work alongside Sandra Campbell, the Indigenous Outreach Coordinator, and the Reverend Evan Smith, who is a United Church Minister. They received their undergraduate degree from the University of Toronto and completed a Master's Divinity at Yale Divinity, where they served as chaplain at the Community Cert Kitchen in New Haven, Connecticut. And uh, Lee represents the Anglican Church of Canada on the Cairo Steering Committee. And uh, Lee is an artist and a musician. Uh, Susan Climo, the Reverend Susan Climo from the Holy Spirit of Peace in Mississauga, uh, graduated from Waterloo Seminary, now Martin Luther University College in 2019 with a Master of Divinity. And she was ordained into the Eastern Synod of the Evangelical Lutheran Church. She, uh, before that, spent almost 20 years in a travel industry, including uh, sales and training in sales. A good thing for a parish ministry or day ministry. <laughs> uh, she serves God and neighbor alongside the people of the Holy Spirit of Peace, a merged Anglican and Lutheran parish. And uh, Susan also works in the wider church in both denominations. Um, and her uh, roles include Regional Dean of Mississauga in the York, York Credit Valley in the Diocese of Toronto and the Chair of Area Council. She's been on Diocesan Council, the Planning Committee for Clergy Conferences, and has worked on the worship team for General Synod in 2016. She's also served on six Eastern Synod uh, um, Assembly events and sits on the National Joint Anglican Lutheran Commission, the Eastern Synod Task Force on the Return to In-Person Worship, and the Board of the National Pensions and Benefit for Lutheran Rostered Ministers and other staff, and chairs the Leadership Committee for the Eastern Synod. Our final speaker is Mark Loyal. Mark is an Aboriginal from Six Nations Reserve, a band member of the Seneca Nation and belongs to the Turtle Clan. His native name translates to wolf caller and Mark is a recipient of, eagle feather, of an eagle feather from both the Six Nations Reserve and from the Blood Kenai Blackfoot Reserve. Mark was born and raised in Windsor, Ontario, uh, attended the University of Windsor and received a Bachelor of Arts with a major in religious studies. He later uh, attended Wycliffe College and graduated with an MDiv in, uh, in 93 and was ordained deacon that year in the Anglican Church in the Diocese of Huron and priest it later that year. Mark served a variety of parishes, first at Six, Na Six Nations and latterly in the Diocese of Calgary, uh, Kiwatna and Huron, where he is currently serving. Uh, Mark has served Anglican parishes, including St. Paul's Anglican Church Blood Canai Reserve and parishes in the city of Calgary. In 2011, Mark moved east to Ontario, where he served several parishes with a shared ministry with the United Church in the Diocese of Kewatin. Mark is now back in the Diocese of Huron um, he, with a stop first in Sandwich, Ontario. He's uh, later moved to Walpole, Walpole Island, where he is rector of St. John the Baptist Anglican Church, Walpole Island First Nation, and minister to Walpole Island United Church since 2018. Mark's been ordained for 29 years with almost equal experience in both Indigenous and non-Indigenous churches and brings insight, wisdom, and worldview as an Aboriginal person and as an Anglican priest. And in his ample spare time, Mark is completing a Doctorate of Theology and Pastoral Theology from Andersonville Theological Seminary. And with that, I uh, turn this over and, and invite Sandra to begin our session, please. Well, thank you, Mary Kate and the planning team for inviting me to be part of this uh, this exciting event that you're holding um, an exploration of ecumenical uh, ministries. I am sharing my screen. I'm also reading my text because otherwise I'm afraid I will uh, simply forget to uh, forget the timeline altogether. 
<laughs> so my uh, my shoots in local pastures are not new ones. Um, as, uh, first, I should just check. You can see my screen, okay? Good. Thanks. Okay. Uh, yes, my shoots in local pastures are not new ones. Um, I served St. Mark's Anglican United Church Shared Ministry in Churchill Falls, Labrador, but that was 30 years ago. <laughs> However, my passion for ecumenical ministry persisted, and I've gone on to research, visit, write about, and teach about such ministries in seminary, retreat centers, and local parishes. I'm delighted that we are going to be hearing today fresh news of ecumenical shared ministries on this panel. Uh, my goal this morning then is to help situate these local expressions in a uh, wider Canadian context. I'll just find the way to forward my slides there. So uh, Canadians have been sharing ministry ecumenically for over a century, but formal Ecumenical Shared Ministries, or ESMs, uh, began in the early 1960s. Uh, four churches, Anglican, Presbyterian, uh, United, and Lutheran, have collaborated to provide support to these ministries, including a definition that we can all uh, share. Um, an ecumenical shared ministry is people worshiping and serving God in a unified way while still maintaining their denominational identity and connections. And um, this is an important phrase. Uh, shared ministries are not about abandoning treasured beliefs and practices, but learning to share uh, mine with you, yours with me, in recognition that Christ is not divided and that the church is one body. So shared ministries uh, share two or, or two or more denominations sharing at least one of building worship ministry personnel program outreach and many of them share all those things um, they operate within a covenant agreement that they've shaped under the oversight of their denominational judicatories uh, diocese presbytery region synod now judicatories is our catch-all word to describe those who offer denominational oversight and for Anglicans then that's primarily bishops and diocesan staff. Well, who does this sharing? <laughs> Here is a list of Canadian denominations and approximately how many ESMs or ecumenical shared ministries each participates in and as you can see Anglicans head the list. Anglicans are involved in 84% of all ESMs in Canada. Now, this is partly because the first ESMs were mostly Anglican United Church sharing. But then the Waterloo Accord, of course, made Anglicans and Evangelical Lutherans natural partners. And you're going to hear about one of those today, uh, at least one of those today. As you can see, uh, some long-standing ESMs, like the one in Chetwind in northern BC, um, comprise more than two of three or even four, and there's one that has five uh, partners. And the Roman Catholic Church, you'll see, does some sharing. Usually it begins and is mostly related to buildings that, that are shared with other denominations, but then that bleeds over a little bit into ministries. And, um, and those other denominations you see in smaller numbers uh, do participate in fully in, in some shared ministries across Canada. And that, that number of other partners is growing too. Well, why do this thing? Um, an anonymous survey that I conducted of ESM parishes several years ago uh, gives us a picture of the reasons they decide to share. And here are the top four with uh, weighted percentages indicating a combined ranking of very important and somewhat important reasons for sharing. Uh, not surprisingly, everyone admitted that practical and financial necessities loomed large in their decision to seek out a partner. Uh, now, lest that seem crass or not pious enough, um, a retired shared ministry minister once said in an interview, there is something in the gospel, isn't there, about being poor and blessed? <laughs> I think it is neat that we did, in fact, need each other, he said. Maybe we are rich because we needed each other. And then look at the other uh, top important reasons. A unified witness, being together, 
sharing programs. So scarcity or perceived scarcity may have created the conditions for the sharing, but as you can see, the fruits are abundant beyond that. Well, um, as, as I mentioned in that first slide, developing a shared ministry covenant takes time and commitment, but fortunately, shared ministries don't have to start from scratch, even though each one does have, as you'll hear, unique challenges and opportunities. Uh, so the ESM handbook, with the link that we'll, you'll find in the chat to it, offers step-by-step -step processes. If you want some further encouragement, sharing ministry ecumenically from the Anglican United Church dialogue uh, is a fine resource, as is that whole 2017 to 2020 dialogue report. I think you'd find it really helpful for thinking about shared ministry. And if you do want a more in-depth exploration, uh, two American friends and I published a book called Daring to Share, um, which looks like a cookbook, but that's what they that's what the publishers chose when they thought about sharing for the cover. Um, it's available on Amazon in ebook or in paperback, and it's about shared ministries in the United States and in Canada with stories, with how to guidelines and with some theological reflection on uh, what what the sharing really means theologically for us. Well, of course, like all ministries, ESMs face challenges, and those that are might be more unique to might be unique to shared ministries can include uneven support. Some bishops and other judicatories are highly supportive and work well with their denominational counterparts. But some others build denominational walls that maintain a suspicion of other churches. Often it is based on misunderstanding and caricature. Sometimes it's based on real challenges which the judicatory is unable or maybe unwilling to face. Um, the lack of full recognition of, of ordered ministries across the denominations is always a struggle. Now, full communion is a grace, and that is what allows Anglicans and Lutherans to move much more smoothly across that challenge than do other partners uh, in this in shared ministry. Um, our geographical boundaries, as you probably know, just don't line up neatly. Uh, the United Church recently restructured, and I was I encouraged them to uh, to create uh, their new structures along the lines of the Anglican diocese across the country, but they didn't. <laughs> so logical ESM partners sometimes live in different jurisdictions with different uh, judica judicatories to report to, and that can be a challenge. Ha! Overwork. Everyone is really really busy. <laughs> sometimes working out the issues around an ESM just seems like one bridge too far. And conflict, either local or based on larger denominational or interdenominational issues, can be tricky. And sometimes judicatories walk away from sharing ministry rather than working through that conflict. But don't despair. <laughs> uh, there are ways that ESM practitioners keep the shoots green and fresh. Um, they cultivate a climate of open and mutual respect. They think of shared ministry not as something that has to have everything tied up neatly, but as something we are trying out, experimenting at being faithful Christians in community together, recognizing that there may be bumps along that way, that it, just as you learn from experimentation what works and what does not work. They use the ties they already have in the community to strengthen their partnership because many shared ministries, uh, people share everything except church together in their community. And this is their opportunity to, to use those, those, all, those ties already that already bind them. Um, and remind ourselves that we are sharing our gifts. We're not competing to overtake one another. As one minister in shared ministry described it, I am most anxious to have added to my life the richness of your ways.
Thank you. And I look forward to hearing the stories of others and to our conversation. So I'll stop sharing and over to Mary Kate. Thank you, Sandra. We're going to turn to, uh, to Lee uh, Kern, who will talk about some of her work, uh, some of their work with the um, I believe it's the Toronto with the um, shared ministries in Toronto, the native shared ministries. So Lee, please. Thank you so much. And thank you, Sandra, for that wonderful presentation. It's great to be with you all here today. Uh, I work at Toronto Urban Native Ministry, where I'm cross appointed as the right relations coordinator. And TUNM was born in the mid 90s out of the uh, experiences of residential school survivors living in the heart of the city and finding themselves not welcome uh, in regular churches. Uh, and by regular, I mean often white dominated uh, worship spaces. So TUNM was really this grassroots movement uh, of people who identified as Indigenous and Christian living in the core of the city uh, and seeking to build a flourishing ministry that met their needs and, and responded to the needs of the Indigenous community across the GTA. So uh, this ministry uh, was led by Grafton Anton of the United Church and then also uh, Reverend Andrew Wesley of the Anglican Church. Um, and so the United Church and Anglican Church really have continued to uphold TUNM, Toronto Urban Native Ministry, um, which is not uh, ex ex exclusively Indigenous led. Uh, it's a predominantly white board. Um, and so seeking to, to move towards uh, Indigenous leadership in fullness is, is always a challenge um, with working in, in church spaces. Um, of really disrupting the power and, you know, who makes the decision. So this is something that TUNM, you know, is always working on. Um, but really, it's a diverse ministry of Indigenous people, settlers, of newcomers, of diasporic communities uh, coming together to seek healing and justice uh, on the land. And we recognize, of course, that this is Indigenous land. Toronto Urban Native Ministry um, also has had participation from the Mennonites and the Roman Catholics over the years, um, but financial support for the ministry has always been a huge challenge. So it's a, a ministry that is really upheld in the public sphere. People use our photos, they want to talk about us, but they do not always financially support us. So every year I have to fundraise for the, the salary of my colleagues. I have to fundraise for our rent, for our office space and all of our programming expenses. And my colleague, Evan Smith has to write a grant every year for their salary. Um, so these challenges are, are really also at the heart of our ecumenical ministry, um, where people want to give a little piece of the pie, uh, but really it often falls on the staff of TUNM to really carry the financial weight of this ministry. Though a lot of people want to see vibrant ministries within the Indigenous community. Um, so that's a really uh, large challenge that we face. And so even when I started at UNM three years ago, I had to go knock on all the doors of the, you know, the Jesuits, uh, the Mennonite Central Committee. I was knocking on every door to find an office. I didn't even have an office when I began. And uh, I was meeting with community members in Tim Hortons, you know, <laughs> to plan funerals and weddings and baptisms. Uh, so out of my office at Tim Hortons in downtown Toronto, uh, we finally found welcome in Church of the Holy Trinity. And there we were able to, all three of us, Evan, Sandra, and myself, have our own space and, and from that space really be able to grow the ministry. Um, before that, we were located out of 40 Oak, uh, which is in Regent Park in downtown Toronto, and is a United Church uh, kind of led space, which is very ecumenical in its history and its roots. So this uh, concept of collaboration and mutuality and sharing has always been at the heart of TUNM, because in the Indigenous community, many people don't necessarily identify with a particular denomination. A lot of folks I know even might go to uh, like one uh, young Anishinaabe man that I work with, 
he goes to a Chinese church because he feels uh, very welcome there and really honored in his identity. And he's one of the only people who doesn't speak Mandarin um, at this parish that he goes to. So our community members often go to, you know, a wide variety of parishes. They might go to Salvation Army sometimes um, and, and then go to a Catholic church other times. So people often move between uh, churches and a lot of people don't really have uh, one spiritual home, but they may have many. So being ecumenical is really at the heart of TUNM and makes it a very vibrant and beautiful ministry. It's been such a joy for me to be able to go to Sacred Circle in the Anglican Church and uh, engage also in the, the National Settler Church and also get to go to the United Church Shining Waters Conference and, and meet people there. So uh, it's, it's really a rich ministry, but it also means that we have to report to many different bodies, <laughs> which is a lot of paperwork. A lot, especially also when you think about needing to fundraise for everything we do. We have to write them reports to so many different bodies. So it's a lot of work uh, to sustain an ecumenical ministry because you do have to speak to and report to even so many different levels of, of governance and, and committees and these kinds of things. So those are just some of the complexities. Um, and now I'll speak to the beautiful work that we do on the ground. Um, so I want to speak today about our ecumenical and also interfaith leadership work that we have done uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic. So as I shared, uh, we were knocking, you know, from door to door, somebody take us, somebody please give us some office space, we can do some ministry. Church of the Holy Trinity took us in. Um, and it's an Anglican church located behind the Eden Center, uh, so right in the heart of downtown Toronto, Young and Dundas. And uh, so when the COVID-19 pandemic swept through the land, all social services shuttered. The doors of churches closed, the Salvation Armies closed, the shelters even closed as outbreaks began to rapidly spread in settings where people were living uh, in close proximity. And so immediately we saw massive desolation uh, in the heart of downtown Toronto. And I'm gonna share my screen now. Everybody can see that okay? Great. So in the heart of downtown Toronto, we saw um, quite extreme desolation. Community members, um, majoritively uh, Indigenous, uh, some studies done during the pandemic found that 80% of homeless or houseless people in the city of Toronto are Indigenous. 80%. It's a lot higher than uh, statistics. Many people are non-status or self-identify. Um, and so that's a big part of the gap in numbers. But when you really talk to people, a lot of people on the street are indigenous. Um, so this massive uh, community of people, about 10,000 people houseless in the city of Toronto, nowhere to go, suddenly found that all the services that they depend on to get showers every day, to have meals every day, to you know, feed and sustain themselves, were closed. Everything shut down on May on March 15, 2020. So our community went into massive crisis, and the fear of the virus was huge. Um, and houseless people, people living on the street, many of them residential school survivors, did not have uh, access to the things that help them sustain their life. So we saw um, a massive increase of deaths, of freezing of people living outside um, and people that live on the land, houseless people were also stigmatized, seen as a vector of transmission, um, seen as dangerous, seen as unclean. So uh, social services really shuttered and stepped back and staff went to working online. However, at Church of the Holy Trinity and Toronto Urban Native Ministry, we went into emergency response mode. Some of our friends um, had worked in HIV for decades and so knew about working uh, through a pandemic. I myself have an immune disorder. So before the pandemic, I would always wear a mask when I fly because I had been hospitalized a couple times after flying and getting a severe illness. 
Um, so I had a, a box of 50 masks. So in that first week of the pandemic, we were able to use that box of masks to stretch us so that we could work safely. And this was before, you know, they were even suggesting the wearing of masks. Uh, but our experience in public health, my own lived experience um, with an immune disorder, helped shape our ministry so that we could really be on the ground and stay with our community. So as you see in this photo, a condo sign uh, has been flipped over and turned into a temporary shelter for someone. As you see, the grass behind them is fenced off. We saw this throughout the pandemic in Toronto, the city of Toronto would fence off grassy areas so that people would not camp uh, while continuing to fail to provide them with safe and adequate shelter. Throughout the pandemic, um, we saw an increase of a push to massive uh, mass shelter spaces uh, where people were more exposed and at risk to the virus. And of course, as housing has been commodified, the people of the land, the people who live on the land, who, who want to live on the land and camp outside um, are not able to access housing. As you see, these, these condos often start at $800,000 and more. Uh, so housing is increasingly unavailable, um, especially to our community members who are survivors of residential school. So our community-based response, which was inherently deeply ecumenical, uh, was to try to meet the needs of our community following their lead. So many of our community members at Toronto Urban Native Ministry may not identify as Christian. Some of them are Muslim. Some of them are of different faiths. Uh, and, but we always follow their lead. So we support them where they're at. And that's um, a principle of self-determination that we really allow to guide us at Toronto Urban Native Ministry. So we spoke to our community members, many of them residential school and day school and Indian hospital survivors. What do you want in this time? And they said, we need tents. We need to live on the land. We need to support each other. We do not feel safe in the shelters. So we immediately began an emergency survival supply drive. We collected and distributed tents um, with Anglican partners, United Church partners, Roman Catholic partners, Korean Catholic churches, uh, the uh, Muslim community, the Toronto Juma Prayer Hall, uh, and many diverse communities came together in this moment. And we were one of the only communities responding. At this time, uh, there was very little support of those living outside. These are two community leaders from Korean Catholic parishes. Uh, neither of them speak English, but they were there with us in the very beginning. They saw visibly that we were serving the houseless, uh, serving those who live on the land, not stopping. Uh, we went from seeing about 30 people a day before the pandemic to 300 people a day in the initial shutdown of the pandemic. And so these incredible Korean Catholic parishes, um, a couple of them out in Etobicoke, saw the work we were doing and immediately came down in their cars with their, their trunks full of items of survival supplies, full of food. And despite the language barriers between us and the cultural barriers, we worked together to respond and meet the needs of 300 people six days a week. Here, my colleague Sandra Campbell of Wata First Nation is um, holding a face mask. So initially in the pandemic, uh, she used her incredible cultural skills of being an amazing sewer to sew cloth masks to give out en masse to our community, while also reaching out to PPE providers to provide free masks for the houseless community so they could protect themselves. Here's one of my uh, colleagues who's a Roman Catholic. Um, and a day school survivor going out and doing outreach to those living on the land across the city with me uh, and providing people with survival supplies. Here's one of our community leaders um, who is not a Christian uh, but works with us very deeply uh, to provide, he himself lives on the land and that's his preferred uh, way of living um, and so he worked with us to get access to buffalo meat uh, in the form of tonka bars so that we could go out and give uh, community members foods that reminded them of their homelands. 
And here you see the encampment around our offices at Trinity Square. Uh, the police would come and raid this place every day, uh, trying to arrest people on faulty warrants. Uh, but we would stand with our community through those experiences and then also try to get them legal support. Uh, there was a profound criminalization of people living on the land um, and also a lack of other options for them. And so this is what my grandmother called my our homeless village <laughs> uh, through the pandemic, where really people were able to provide water to each other, uh, hygiene supplies, PPE, and the things that we needed, uh, such as food, just to survive day to day. We also went into um, pandemic response. And so here you see my colleague, Sandra Campbell. This is in May of 2020, doing the very first uh, COVID-19 testing clinic on the land with the people in Trinity Square. So where the encampment was, we held vaccine and uh, testing clinics so that people could have access to medical care. Um, because a big part of TUNM was recognizing that the churches, of course, have caused such profound harm to Indigenous communities that people often don't find their home in an institution. So accessing healthcare at a hospital can be a very triggering experience for survivors of Indian hospitals where many were tortured for years and detained as children. So providing healthcare on the land and with the people with an ecumenical and interfaith and intercultural perspective uh, has been incredibly profound for our communities. And here you see uh, Reverend Evan Smith and Sandra Campbell, Jess Swans, and myself at uh, our first vaccination clinics in the community. And of course, you see the tents here lined up against the church, the photos from the first days of the pandemic. Here uh, is Lois Kunkel of uh, United Church, uh, Trinity St. Paul's, who worked to provide us also with food all throughout the pandemic, uh, working with us collaboratively. And uh, her daughter, Tara Curry, who is our head chef at what we began to call, because feeding 300 people a day is very challenging. So we needed to start something called Unity Kitchen, which was the name of all these different groups coming together to feed our communities. And so Tara Curry is our head chef. And here's some community members uh, enjoying the beautiful sunshine and of living outside on the land. And we're very proud to say that all throughout the pandemic, we had zero transmission of COVID to our communities. And, uh, and I'll just wrap up, but here is uh, more of our friends from the Korean Catholic Church bringing food down uh, to the community. Uh, Grace Church Markham supplying us with warm clothing and shoes for community members um, and more community doing outreach for us. And uh, there's me hauling a bunch of soup from Trinity St. Paul's across the city. So together we were able to, to meet the needs of our community, to center them, to center self-determination and work to live out the works of mercy uh, as the body of Christ in such a difficult time. And thank you. Thank you, Lee, uh, for telling us about the work of the Toronto Urban Native Ministry. Uh, we'll move to uh, Susan, please. Oh. Thank you very much, Mary Kate and Sandra and Lee. Tough acts to follow, uh, but I will uh, I will attempt to share a bit of my story, uh, my adventure in ecumenism, if you will, uh, which began uh, back in 2011. Uh, I had been ordained a couple of years and was serving a Lutheran parish situated in Square One Shopping Centre in Mississauga. We were right in the mall. Uh, and very suddenly and abruptly, after almost 30, more than 35 years of service there, uh, we were advised that our lease was being terminated because they were going to be enlarging and enhancing the food court. So uh, as a result of that, basically our uh, desire to move forward in terms of ecumenism was born out of a very urgent practical need, speaking to Sandra's uh, explanation of the various reasons that motivated uh, groups to become involved ecumenically. Uh, we needed somewhere to worship. And after searching for another space of our own, it became apparent that we were not going to be able to afford a space separately. 
Uh, and then because of the Waterloo relationship, the Waterloo Declaration in 2001 brought the Anglican and Lutheran, Evangelical Lutheran denominations into full communion in Canada, uh, the logical place to start was to look at our Anglican neighbours to see if we might share space with them. And so we found ourselves initially simply as tenants uh, at Holy Spirit, Church of the Holy Spirit Anglican, which was about five kilometres down the road from our square one location. Uh, so initially, it was just a very pragmatic relationship, but the priest at the time, uh, Judith Altry, and I were incredibly simpatico from the moment we met, uh, and we saw that there was so much more that could come of this than a mere uh, transactional kind of relationship, uh, and it was born out of mutual need, to be honest. We needed space. Holy Spirit had a revenue crunch, uh, so much so that unfortunately, not long after we arrived, um, Judith had to leave because the parish couldn't afford to keep paying her. Uh, so I was asked by the bishop at the time, Philip Poole, uh, if I would be willing to step in as interim priest in charge. Uh, and so that I, I sort of, with great trepidation, took on that role. And for a period, we still remained as two parallel congregations or parishes um, that shared a, a minister. Uh, so we had full-on Anglican services and full-on Lutheran services, and I bounced back and forth between the two. Uh, but even at those early days, there was definitely a desire between the two communities to get to know one another more, and we began to take some tentative first steps in terms of sharing Bible study, uh, sharing outreach in the community, because a happy accident, we discovered that both congregations had been supporting the same agency, the Open Door, which operated out of square one. Uh, and so that was a great place for us to join forces and continue to support them with chili lunches uh, that we offered once a month. And that gave the people of both communities an opportunity to spend some time with one another, get to know each other a little bit better, and slowly but surely those relationships formed. Relationships that I feel are really essential in successful ecumenical ministry. Uh, the people have to care for each other, uh, and I think much can come from that initial spark of a relationship for me. So after a little bit of time just living parallel lives uh, in the same space and sharing a bit of ministry, we uh, then found that uh, in the summer months, uh, we had permission from the bishop, uh, the, our Anglican bishop. Lutherans are a little bit more relaxed about all this stuff, I gotta say. Uh, <laughs> um, our Anglican bishop gave us permission to worship together for the summer. And out of that came a further deepening of the relationship. We explored both traditions, liturgies, so we would do a completely Lutheran service one Sunday, a completely Anglican service the next, and I had a little evaluation forms for everyone to fill out to say, here's what I liked best about the service today, here's something that I wasn't too crazy about or I was unsure about or had questions about, uh, and the amazing thing that came out of that was across both traditions, and all of the participants in worship, because I tell, said to people, don't identify yourself as one or the other. It's just anonymous. But by and large, everyone said what they liked best was the music, no matter which service we were doing. And they liked hearing scripture and hearing the word preached on. And that's mutual to both traditions. There's nothing exclusively Anglican or Lutheran about any of that. And so we were able to lift that up as a real place of unity for us, even if without uniformity, that we could be unified. Uh, and when the end of that summer came, uh, there was a parking lot meeting, the best kind of meeting ever, uh, where a group of parishioners from both traditions had been chatting. And subsequent to that, I received an email from one saying, you know, we were talking and couldn't we just keep worshiping together? Yay! <laughs> Thanks to Jesus. Uh, that was the moment I'd been waiting for because there had been some pressure um, from the judicatories to kind of move this forward, move it along. And I had felt very strongly that it had to be something that organically emerged from the desires of the two communities, that if it was imposed from above, it would be resisted. Even if people thought it was a good idea, they would say it was a bad idea just because somebody from head office said that we should do it. Uh, so now that there was that desire that was blooming within the community, it was the time to take action. So we immediately called a meeting with the Anglican bishop who came and talked about what the ramifications would be and what the process would be to move this forward. He was enormously supportive. And uh, we began exploring what it would mean to become a merged community. 
Uh, we did a field trip to Aurelia, uh, where there was an already quite well-developed and thriving uh, merged community at St. David's uh, Lutheran Anglican Church. Uh, and we also, I made a visit to Midland to visit uh, a church there that was also in the midst of developing their merger document, which they very generously shared with us. And uh, after about a year of doing our homework and having discussions about what we wanted to keep and what we might put to one side uh, of the traditions, we were ready to move forward. And uh, as of January 1st of 2016, we became a fully officially merged congregation uh, of both the Diocese of Toronto in the Anglican tradition and the Eastern Synod of the ELCIC. I think, as I said, the things that made our ministry move forward as well as it did was first of all the fact that it did develop from among the two communities that it was not a forced relationship it was one that developed I, I always jokingly said that we lived together for a few years before we got married uh, and that gave people an opportunity to to sort of kick the tires and, and test things out and, and try different things experiment as Sandra had mentioned uh, and that was very important the other thing that was extremely important is that we did have the support and encouragement of both judicatories, also essential. Um, but particular personalities within the judicatory can help or hamper your efforts. And actually, we were in a bit of a stalemate until there was a change in some of the personnel on the Anglican side, um, specifically in the area of the chancellor, um, because the, the view of canon law of the predecessor of our current chancellor was different. And so there were many more hoops that we were going to have to jump through in order to be able to do what we wanted to. Um, but the change in personnel opened new possibilities. Uh, and so we were able to move forward more quickly than might have been the case uh, under the previous chancellor, who is of blessed memory and I know was a fine, fine chancellor, but just had a different understanding of ecumenism and, and of how the two denominations could work together. Uh, so that was very important. Uh, the will of the two congregations was very important. And I think an openness, uh, as Sandra said, a, um, a sense of mutual respect. I was quite deliberate in frequently telling people things that I loved about the Anglican tradition because I thought it was important for my Lutherans to hear that. Um, but I also would lift up places in which I thought the Lutheran tradition had something valuable to offer uh, to our Anglican brothers and sisters. And I encouraged them to share those things with one another as well. And one of the funniest parts of it, one of, one of the things I found most entertaining is, of course, I think each local community of any denomination tends to develop an identity that they feel is definitely the definitive uh, identity for one of their denomination's communities. So, you know, the way that Peace Lutheran was Lutheran, they believed was the only way to be Lutheran. And Holy Spirit felt that they were quintessentially Anglican, right? And so for me, as, as sort of an outsider, if you will, because I wasn't born and raised in Peace Lutheran and I was brand new to Holy Spirit, to be able to say to them, you know, I've visited other Anglican parishes and I've worshipped at other Anglican churches and they don't do it this way. Uh, and to say to my Lutherans, you know, the Lutheran church I grew up in in Montreal never did the stuff that you do. So it helped them to recognize that even within the denomination, there is no one definitive way to express the tradition, um, that every local community is unique. Context is everything and has to be honored and lifted up. Uh, and we need to find ways to live into our identity using what we have at our disposal and the traditions that we've developed locally and, and not uh, feeling that there, there is a one-size-fits-all answer to what it means to be Anglican or Lutheran or United or Presbyterian or anything. Um, what we all are is Christian. And that has been, I think, one of the things that has continued to motivate my folks is desiring to embody Christ's prayer that we would be one. Um, so they didn't start out with that as their intention but they've grown into a real sense of being able to witness in the larger community to the fact that being Christian is the most important thing and all the denominational stuff comes after. So that's our story. Thank you so much, Susan. Um, in the interest of time, I'm just gonna move quickly on to our final uh, speaker or final panelist, um, Mark Loyal. 
Thank you, uh, Mary Kate. Thank you for inviting me here. It's a real honor uh, to be here and to speak about my little corner of the earth. Actually, it's not my corner of the earth. It's God's <laughs> God's corner of the earth. And to be and to be part of this, um, I, I don't have a better word. Illustrious panel. Thank you, um, Lee and Susan, Sandra. I'm I'm taking something away from each of you that furthers my understanding of, of ecumenism and, and, and the work that you do, Lee and Susan, your, um, your, your amalgamation or the, the, the Lutheran and the, and the uh, Anglican and Cassandra, you just outlined the whole bit what ecum ecumenical ministry is. So it's kind of, from my experience of thinking, uh, oh yeah, we do that. We do that. We do checklists. So that was really positive. So thank, thank you, the three of you, for 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 helping me deepen my understanding. I really do mean that and appreciate that. And uh, Mary Kate, thank you for asking me to be here today. I'm going to try to keep within my time frame. Um, <clears throat> so <laughs> when I say that, I never do. So don't worry about it. <laughs> but anyway. Um, as you know, I, I'm Mark Loyal. I, I've been uh, ordained 29 years, and I, I've had a lot of different ministries. I've been in the Diocese of Huron, where I am now, the Diocese of Calgary, the Diocese of Kiwaton, which uh, dissolved, and when before I left, it was the Diocese of Rupert's Land. So I've been in, in four dioceses, and I've been in two. This is my second shared ministry with United Church. The first one was in uh, Red Lake, which is northwestern Ontario. It's about five hours from Thunder Bay, north and up, way up. It's at the end of the earth. It actually is. <laughs> when you get to the highway there, there's just a lake and rocks and there's a town and that's it. Anyway, um, so that was my first encounter with, uh, with um, ecumenical uh, ministry in terms of a shared ministry. I, I won't spend time on that. Uh, one, um, because I think what I was wanted or asked to to focus on is is where I am now, and that it is uh, indigenous shared ministry. Um, the thing that uh, they really share is me, <laughs> and I'll explain this as I go on. But I, I'm fifty percent half at uh, Saint John's Anglican Church, Saint John the Baptist Anglican Church, and. Walpole Island United Church. But before I get to that, I'm just going to give you some brief details about Walpole Island. People might not know where the heck that is. Walpole Island is um, <clears throat> it is an island uh, in the First Nations Reserve in southwestern Ontario. It's between the border of Ontario and Michigan in Michigan, United States. It's located at the mouth of St. Clair River on Lake St. Clair and about 121 kilometers uh, by road from Windsor, Ontario, and 124 kilometers from Detroit, Michigan. It actually is an island. The way you go come onto the island is a bridge. It's the only access on and off the island. There is no other way, and it's surrounded by water. Um, uh, Lake Saint Clair uh, and and Cur Saint Clair River, and the name. <coughs> Um, because of Kwong, that I said that wrong and I'm sorry, I apologize. I don't like to butcher people's languages. It's not my language, but I don't really know my language, <laughs> my mother tongue. I don't know that, but uh, it means where the waters divide in, in Ojibwe. Um, so the, the, uh, the population of Walpole Island or the, the, the nations that exist there are the uh, Potawatomi, the Chippewa, and the, uh, the, the Ottawa, the J Ojibwe. The language there, uh, traditional language was Ojibwe. <clears throat> and um, it was settled in the uh, early 1700s. Uh, in 1844, Jesuits, and I'm just talking about the church history here a little bit because it's gonna lead into my particular ministry. Um, the Jesuits in 1844 uh, from nearby Sandwich uh, in Windsor, outside of Windsor, where I was, I was the rector there, not in 1844, obviously. <laughs> but uh, anyway, it, it's, uh, 
the Jesuits came and they, the Ojibwe, the council and the chief, they didn't want them there. And they, they, they took precious, they cut down some trees which were precious to them, to the community, and they built their church. And uh, the community was so upset that it actually burned the church down and it forced the Jesuits out. So there is, there is very few uh, Roman Catholic connection to this day. There are some, uh, but really they're, they're, they go off the island to have their Roman Catholic uh, denomination. And that's one of the reasons. Um, so there are two settlements on the island. One is up, uh, one is um, uh, a, 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 lo a lower end and an upper end. One, one's by the river, by St. Clair River, and that's where the Anglican church is. And the other is on the other side of the other river. And that's where uh, the United Church was. And so that's, so basically those families and pizzas, pe uh, people who settled there uh, belong to either the Anglican Church or before uh, 1929, I believe, it was a Methodist Church. And, and um, so that's what we have today. There are three churches that exist on the island. There's the Anglican Church, the United Church, and the, uh, it's a Pentecostal church called uh, the Evangelistic Center. And so um, most families who are Christian belong to any three of those. And uh, the original shared ministry began, well, I don't know if it began, but it, it goes back to 1975. I don't know if people know uh, Canon Laverne Jacobs, Reverend Canon Laverne Jacobs. I know Lee does. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> He, he was the, uh, the minister when he was ordained in 1975, I believe, 1976, 77, he came to the, uh, back to the island after his studies and his, his curiosity. Uh, he came back and, and started the, um, <clears throat> or maintained a, a, a shared ministry between the Anglican and the United Church. That operated with different ministers, Anglican and United, uh, going back and forth till about the late 80s, early 90s. And then a priest was appointed. The last two priests before me were strictly Anglican. They had kind of, I don't know what the reason was, but they stopped that. I, and I think they just kind of, things were working out. And I don't think the minister, the priest were appointed to the Anglican Church were really interested in that. And so it just kind of uh, petered out. Uh, what happened when I came, uh, I am a full-time cleric, a priest, and, and um, so it was suggested that I, I was interested in the island and, and, and kind of coming back to do some native ministry for a while. And, um, <clears throat> and it was suggested I do half time at the Anglican, half time at the United, which both churches could afford. That is the, the extent of the shared ministry between the two communities. They get along fine. I don't think at any point they would want to uh, abandon their buildings and become one. But at this point, they, they share me. And I'm 50%. I do uh, one service on at nine o'clock on Sunday and at the Anglican Church in the 1030 uh, United Church. It's totally united. I don't wear vestments. I do, you know, a different kind of structure from the Anglicans. Um, but at, you know, the Anglicans, I wear vestments in the whole nine yards. So it's, it's Anglican and united. So I'm kind of, I always tell people I'm split down the middle. I get 50% my pay comes from the Anglicans, 50% from the United. So I call my, refer to myself as an Anglican priest and a United Church minister. And that's kind of how I operate. And, um, but they never came forward and said, we want you to unite us. We want you to do this, but that's the way it's worked out. Um, we do share five services a year on the fifth Sunday of, before COVID. Right now we haven't done that because of we're not completely done with that. Um, the fifth Sunday of every year or every year, every month, uh, we do a 
uh, a hymn sing between the two churches and we alternate at each church then we have a lunch after and we do you know and it's it's lots of jibway singing and old oldie goldie hymns and all that stuff and you know and they like that and and both congregate members of congregation unite uh the congregations are fairly small on a sunday at the anglican church we'll see anywhere from 13 to 20 people at the united church we'll see anywhere from 8 to 12. they're fairly small uh there's not a lot of you no youth or uh children but one of the ministries we do a lot of is uh we do funerals i do about uh, 20 to 25 funerals a year and it's um because people are very connected to their churches they they will go there <laughs> but if somebody dies they are connected they want that uh and if that's if they're anglican or united and that's in their family they want that um church tradition at that funeral in their family so we do a lot of funerals and all sorts of um tragedies suicides children um and we have done covid it, it's been it's been uh, it, it, it and i'm not saying to, for make people make people feel sorry for me it's just part of the ministry part of the plight of of being in a native community that's the thing we face on a daily basis is death and lee's done a good job about showing what some of our people in the cities face um so i think i'll sum that up quickly i i hope i i know i didn't go over my time i went over my time i'm sorry anyway um but those are the, the, um that's kind of i hope that gives a little picture of of what we do and um and and of our ministry and if later if there are questions hopefully i can answer that um but i'll i'll i'll, I'll just give two points I, I not sophisticated sandra's presentation um but but two obvious things that because this works and it worked in red lake as well um it, there's a need um in red lake it was we needed a building or, or the Anglicans needed a building. The United, the Anglicans had a priest, and the United had a building, and so they came together. It was a need for us now, where I am at, on Walpole Island. They need a pre a minister, so they've got one, and they both they share me, and so there's a need, and then there's the willingness and the, to come together and and to want this work. To however it works, like I said, there's um red lake was a completely different uh way of doing it it was almost like that was a shared ministry because that it really did share but here it's sharing the priest and i know it, they're both are shared ministries it's just they're they're a little different and so what i'm used to is different than than what it is now so i'm thinking oh it's not really a shared ministry it's just a share me but it is a shared ministry <laughs> anyway in our culture, we always thank our people for listening. So thank you for listening. And I hope this was helpful to your gathering today. And I offer my words to the creator and to each of you. Wow. Well, gosh, what to say? What, what a, a glorious, uh, wonderful panel and discussion we've had we we started a little bit late and we've gone a little bit late i know that some people will have to leave but if there i see some questions already in the chat um you know i, I was mindful that yesterday uh, archbishop john boland said ecumenical friendship changes landscape and and walking ecumenically is a grace and have we not seen this over and over again in these wonderful wonderful discussions um and and how how glorious it is that out of the simplest things um come these rich rich um moments and rich helps and and rich ministries um I have a couple of questions here. Uh, the first one, I think this is for Mark. Uh, Allison asked, does Walpole Island use any indigenous ceremony in either worshiping community? Um, yes, there, there is. Uh, 
We, uh, for special occasions, um, I, I, because I'm a feather holder, and that's not to toot my own horn, but that, that is, uh, in, in, in our culture, that's uh, one of the most greatest honors you can have. And so I'm blessed and for that honor. Because of that, I, I do do, and because the community, the church community, uh, particularly the Anglican church, has allowed me to do the smudging ceremony to lead that, as well as the four directions ceremony. So that's a ceremony where it's uh, in four directions. You pray uh, for the people and you honor the four directions and what they represent using and burning uh, the various, the four main medicines of the Ojibwe people. Uh, and you do that. Um, so uh, we do that, uh, but only on special occasions. Um, like Advent, I'll do the four directions. Uh, when I was first uh, there as an induction, we would, um, I did the smudging, we did smudging at the door, but it was outside. Um, so we still have to watch um, because the big thing is some of the people in the church, some of our Christians would be offended by that. So you don't want to offend um, and so you don't kind of bring it in full, full barrel. Um, but they, but for the four directions that's in the ceremony in the church, they're okay with it. Um, they seem to be, everybody seems to be okay with it. So, um, I hope that answers your question, Allison. Uh, another another question, I think this is for everybody, um, from Paige, and it says, what did you need to learn about yourself in order to undertake shared ministry? Well, that's a, it's probably a session in and of itself. It's a great question. Uh, anybody like to jump in on that? I, I guess for me, it was a matter of, of really being tuned into the fact that I'm a cradle Lutheran. I mean, both my parents are Lutheran from Northern Europe. I, I mean, I tell people I was genetically predisposed to Lutheranism. I had no choice. Um, also grew up two doors up from the church. So, I mean, everything was pointing me towards very strongly identifying with, with my tradition. Uh, and, and I had to learn to hold that lightly uh, because I, I'm still Lutheran. I will always be Lutheran. But I now often will describe myself as a Lutherkin or as an Anglican because I absolutely feel so blessed by the, the presence of Anglican tradition and liturgy and hymnody and all of that um, that has greatly enriched my life. But, but to start with, it was really important to try and approach it with curiosity and with respect uh, and, and to be able to hold my tradition lightly and, and not have that sense of, well, we do it right. So, you know, yeah, it's interesting to hear what you do, but, but Lutherans have it right. Uh, had, to, had to let go of that. Would anybody else on the panel like to offer? <laughs> I'll, I'll just add to that. I think um, I, I, was, I learned about my, I was a lot more adaptable than, than I am. I, I'm a cradle Anglican. I was baptized when I was seven months old, and I was called, I felt the call at 10 years old to the administrator or when I was 25. So I, you know, I'm a, I'm an Anglican by and by and far and through it, but I always thought I'm a Christian first. And, and, and that allowed me to just be, be kind of like what you said, Susan, about, you know, it wasn't blue thread, they're just wanting to be Christian. And, and, that's kind of what I learned about myself that I'm a, well, I knew I was a Christian first, but that I could do, enter both communities fairly and give to them what they need spiritually as their leader and, and in a Christian, in a, um, a way of integrity. Anyway, that's, thank you. And I'll add to that. Um, I really, I think for myself, you know, being a young person from Southern Ontario, like I was able to experience so many different cultures uh, growing up and uh, have family that are Muslim. Um, and so I, I've really, and then of course, you know, getting to go to a traditional ceremony and my dad's an Anglican priest. So um, I really naturally in my life got to experience so much different culture and uh, religion. And so interfaith work, intercultural work uh, is so important to me. And it really, to me, is like about 
like, uh, you know, how do we decenter whiteness in the church? Uh, and it really is through our relationships. Um, and like I shared in the presentation, like working with people who don't speak English, um, but coming together, um, you know, so at Unity Kitchen, we have pictures. Uh, so we serve food every day and then we, we have, we serve survival supplies, but we use pictures so people can point to what they need. Um, you know, and all these things were just learnings through being with people that are different. I only speak English, like monolingual, you know? Um, and so, you know, trying to challenge my own experiences of privilege, uh, trying to engage people that are different from myself and working together is always, you know, a humbling experience and a stretching experience. Um, but it's really, it's such a gift. Uh, so that's something that I would, I would share that I continue to be challenged and to keep learning. I guess I would, I, I would echo everything I've heard from folks that you, you, like I had, I was really strongly grounded in my United Church tradition as well and and I still am but there was something that I always felt I didn't have enough of and there's so there's this, this kind of um uh you know wedding at Cana experience of finding out there's all this other wonderful wine out there and and uh learning to to to, to just and I heard the word curiosity amongst you but you know be curious about others and believe uh, as deeply as I believe that, uh, you know, I've come to faith in this particular way that that others have a um, have a gift that to share that is so important. Um, and it doesn't mean you don't stumble and screw up and sometimes, you know, lose patience <laughs> with with your own denomination and the other self. <laughs> but I, I guess it's there is it. The question is a good one from Paige, because I think it really does require you know, a heart and a, and a, and a mindset, not just a set of tools. So it's, I think, appreciate the question and all the good responses I've heard. Well, thank you, all of you. I think uh, what a great place to, to end, to wrap up our session. I had a question. You know, there was one of the panelists yesterday had said um, the gateway to ecumenism is at the local parishes. And, and you know, I, I was had thought to maybe ask a, a question exploring that you know where are we pushing the boundaries at the local level is this is this where is the the heartbeat of ecumenism lies and i think there is no question really to that you have answered that in such brilliant and creative and thoughtful ways and and what a joy to be with all of you um, sandra susan lee and mark thank you so much on behalf of the committee thank you so very much for contributing uh to our discussion and to providing this, this hope and vision um, and, and promise of what we can do at the local level. Thank you once again, and thank you to all of us who joined us online. Um, there's another session today. If you're able to join us, we'll be looking at ecumenism in, uh, th in theological colleges and how it's being approached. But um, in the meantime, my thanks to all of you and may you go with God and, and uh, thank you for, for being part of our conference.